So good morning and uh, welcome to Slack. Um, my name's Tom Devereaux. I, you might remember uh, f uh, uh, three days ago or four days ago on Monday, I was the one to welcome you. I'm the ALD, Associate Lab Director of Photon Science and the Director of SIMES. Uh, I'm glad that you could uh, come up to Slack and get a, a glimpse of the research that's going on here. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so before I start, uh, I just want to give an announcement. We're OK? Um, just in terms of the, the buses back to Stanford, uh, which will happen at uh, lunch right after the, the tours. And I believe if you're GSB students, you're going to be looking for bus number one or number two. And they're going to take you on a special trip, I gather, uh, to take you back to the B, the B school at, at, at noon. OK? So uh, last year at Slack, we celebrated our, our 50th birthday. Um, from its humbling beginnings in, in uh, the early 60s, Slack has really undergone a change, and particularly the last couple of years has really changed the landscape. Uh, it started actually by thinking not on working on a problem that was simple, but on working on a problem that was very, very difficult, uh, which is very appropriate to think about in the context of where we are now when we're looking at and thinking about energy which is also a very difficult problem. At that time, Slack was started as the, uh, the, one of the largest projects uh, in, in history with the desire to build a LINAC, a linear accelerator, which still exists today. Uh, and here are the people at the time putting, thinking about uh, the site and planning what it would look like. And this is what it turned out to be. No. That one's dead. Let's try this one. Um, you probably can't see the, uh, the little light all the way back there anyway. But uh, so the, the LINAC was constructed. It's about two miles long in its initial phase. And you could see you're looking uh, out towards the ocean in this direction. So there is no Interstate 280 at that, at that time. And uh, so the, the, the problem was difficult because one started to inject uh, particles, electrons, down at this end of the LINAC and accelerate them to just about the speed of light as fast uh, um, as, as they could get them to go with the power available at the time, uh, to bring them two miles down the end of the LINAC uh, while maintaining the, uh, the uh, precision to the thickness of a human hair over the entire length of the LINAC to deliver at the end to have violent collisions to look for fundamental particles that make what now make up our standard model of particle physics, the elementary building blocks of, of matter. And through the years, the, uh, there have been several Nobel Prizes which came through the uh, investment in the, in the LINAC, uh, starting in 1976, which is the dis discovery of the JSI particle by Bert Richter, who's uh, still here at SLAC. And then through uh, the, the 90s, this is looking at the inner uh, makeup of the, the uh, nucleus, the electrons, so that's the quarks. Uh, which make up the uh, protons and neutrons, and discovery of a heavy electron, the tau lepton, uh, which Nobel Prize was given in 1995 by, uh, with uh, Martin Pearl, who also is still here at, uh, at SLAC. And then um, after uh, this long run of successful research in particle physics, uh, along at the beginning, it was decided that, hey, uh, electrons which are moving can be, can be coerced to uh, emit x-rays. And those x-rays, just as you use x-rays to look at the broken bones of, of your arm or your body, could be used to really, instead of violently collide and rip apart something, but to interrogate fundamental properties of collections of atoms at their intrinsic length scale, at the length scale of atoms, and on their intrinsic time scale to really understand how energy moves at a microscopic level. And so, uh, so that was SSRL, which sta sta stands for Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratories, uh, which started off as a project uh, to operate parasitically along this, this beam. And then in 2009, the, the LINAC was repurposed instead of sending particles down to, to have collisions down, down uh, at the PEP ring, which is not shown here, a larger ring here. Uh, it, was, it was repositioned to use the electrons and send them through wigglers to emit high energy x-rays. 
And those x-rays are extremely powerful to be able to see individual atoms uh, moving at their, uh, at their own length scales and their own, own time scales. So that's the LINAC coherent light source, LCLS. And right now, it only operates uh, then down at the lower one third of the uh, LINAC and delivers x-rays to two areas, <clears throat> the uh, near experimental hall and the far experimental hall down here at the, down here at the bottom. So these are the, the facilities that you're going to be going to be touring uh, later today uh, <clears throat> and get a glimpse of really what some of the cutting area of research is, which involves the high energy x-rays. And then we're positioned for the next at least 25 years in terms of development as the back two thirds of the LINAC will be developed and used for the second phase of LCLS, LCLS2, which will be operating to deliver uh, x-rays at a much, much faster rate to be able to, to do much, uh, much um, more diverse set of experiments that involve uh, timing with other sorts of lasers to sort of stimulate matter and then watch the way in which it responds, again, at time scales which are extremely short to capture the motion of atoms and electrons moving around. So Slack diversified its portfolio over the last few years with the development of several institutes and areas of science. It still remains uh, at the forefront of high energy physics through the collaboration of Babar, which is to produce B mesons as original in incarnation at the early days of the LINAC, uh, to uh, a growing field in astrophysics with the Kavli building, which is just the building behind, behind us here. Uh, which is looking at the forefront of science at the very, very large scale, such as the uh, beginning of the universe and the evolution of, of galaxies and, and star formation and so on. And again, with uh, starting to, or trying to remain at the forefront for accelerator technologies, for example, facet of way of de de developing accelerators which operate with less energy and more powerful. Uh, but in, uh, in the last few years, uh, this area of x-ray science, and that's where photon science comes from, that's what I'm the ALD of, uh, gave birth to several organizations, institutes that sit at the boundary between SLAC and Stanford. So they consist of faculty who are, on, uh, are at, at SLAC and Stanford, uh, staff scientists, postdocs, graduate students, and so on, over many schools, many disciplines, physics, applied physics, chemistry, material science and engineering, electrical engineering, chemistry, uh, and biology. And so the three institutes that we have today, one is uh, SUNCAT, uh, which is a uh, organization which is looking at the properties of catalysis, broadly speaking, but in particular, the way interfaces between different uh, constituents can be coerced to produce a, by, a byproduct in a way which is extremely efficient and can be controlled at a sort of fundamental level of uh, uh, using knowledge from basic basic research. Pulse is an institute to look at ultra-fast uh, science of using lasers which can be tuned to very, very high precision. They're monochromatic light and they can be uh, lined up to look at dynamics uh, of electrons at, at femtosecond time scales, 10 to the minus 15 seconds, which is extremely short for us, but that's the speed in which electrons are moving around in solids or in, in molecules and atoms. And then SIMES is one of the, uh, the ones that is a co-sponsor of the summer school, uh, which is a Stanford Institute for Materials and Energy Science, which is a materials, also the material science division at SLAC, which is really aimed at understanding fundamental properties of matter and how that matter could be tailored to produce a desired functionality, in particular with a focus on energy. And throughout the, the years, supercomputing has always been a key area of, of, uh, of lab research, and that's continued to develop over the years. So in the context of our workshop here, we're really looking at uh, understanding what we can do and what you can do uh, during your, your uh, career in the focus on energy. And what you'll be hearing here is really what is the basic science aspect working on some of the key problems in energy science. And so uh, the history is, of course, really replete with, with examples of really fundamental research, which was not very targeted at the time, manifesting itself in things which have revolutionized our world, such as the transistor and the internet and, and so on. And so I don't know, you probably can't read that, 
this quote that, that I have down in the back here, but this is from Alexander Fleming, who got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of penicillin, and I think he captured things correctly when he said that uh, the truth is that penicillin started really as a chance observation, and his only merit was that he didn't neglect the observation and he pursued the subject. So we often say that doing science and basic research is a bit like shooting an arrow into the air, and wherever it lands, that's where you draw the target. <laughs> so uh, we need new paradigms. Why? Well, this is a, an example that I don't know if you've seen during the week, but this is a perfect case that we're very far away from where we would like to be if we're ever thinking of replacing fossil fuels, or gasoline in this case, with some other type of energy source. And what really is, is uh, uh, amazing to see is this plot, both of energy per unit volume or energy per unit weight. And if you look at, the, look at uh, uh, where gasoline sits, it sits way over here. It packs a lot of energy, both in a small volume and a small amount of weight, which means that it's perfect for what it's been used for. And if you compare, let's, let's say we replace gasoline or fossil fuels with batteries, Batteries are hardly noticeable on the scale in terms of similar metric of energy per volume or energy per weight. So it's not that we can take batteries and make incremental changes. We're really far away from where we would like to be in terms of energy density. Um, and so that's why we need new paradigms. And so you'll be hearing more of this throughout the day and in, in, in Mark's talk. But so, for example, one of the things that, that we've been w working on in the area of batteries is how to make batteries cheaper with higher energy density so that can be used in wide-scale applications and store energy, uh, green energy, in the places that it's, it's produced, say in Mojave Desert or wherever the wind happens to be, so that it can be transported to where it's being used, such as uh, in, in large cities. So, uh, and so really, it's really taking a ground up view of the fundamental processes of what a battery looks like and thinking what are the new paradigms in which we can try to, to construct batteries for our usage. And so this is a case where uh, Yi Chui, who is in, in, in SIMES, is a Stanford uh, faculty, uh, took the idea of, of, of uh, bringing lithium together with sulfur. Sulfur is ubiquitous, it's very cheap people would probably take, pay you to take it away and combine it in a liquid flow battery so that you can, uh, this battery acts uh, or the, the liquid acts as a, a reserve of energy and you can see maybe this little LED being, being lit up. So these flow batteries are a significant discovery and uh, uh, hold a promise to be developed somewhere down the line. This is basic research as being a viable method to store large scale uh, energy. So um, in this context, we're looking at problems which are really uh, focusing on these three sides, energy transmission, energy storage, and energy generation. And so we would like to, to say, well, what would happen if we were successful? What are the things that we're aiming for? And so our research, for example, focuses on superconductivity. If we're successful of making superconductivity to happen at elevated temperatures, right now you have to cool things to very, very low temperatures to get this uh, phenomena of superconductivity, then we'd be able to carry electricity without resistance, without any loss whatsoever for thousands of kilometers. And there are test facilities that are in, in existence today where that's possible to, to wire at least a portion of a city using superconducting cables. Uh, we're looking at ground up design from the, atom the atoms on up, a way of producing some functionality, in this case being able to store energy in a small volume and low weight uh, to increase uh, the, the carrying capacity and also the reliability and also keep costs down. And the same for photon harvesting of the way in which we can make uh, solar cells be, of course, more efficient, but at the same time making them cheaper and economically more competitive with gold. Uh, I'm sorry, with coal. <laughs> gold, yeah. <laughs> it is just like gold. Okay, so with that, uh, that's the overview of what, what I think you'll be hearing during, during the afternoon. So what I'm going to do then is turn the uh, podium over to Mark Hartney.